Shake it up, shake it down, move it in, move it round, disco baby. Move it in, move it out, move it in and about, disco baby. Everybody and welcome to another episode of Pod Stallions. I am Brian over here in Canada, and over on the other side of the border is my pal Jason. How are you, Jason? I'm very well. Hello, everyone. Nice to be back, hey. buddy. And um, we're joined by a special guest today, right? Yes, we are. This is uh, an old friend of mine named Steve Kozak. Steve, say hello to everyone. Hey, everybody. Nice to be here. Steve and I go back farther than I care to recall. Um, but we worked on a show many years ago in Hollywood, and he has been working in television for 25 years um, as, uh, well, many, many facets, a lot, a lot to do with clip licensing for shows. Uh, but he's done lots of stuff. He's worked on Whose Line Is It Anyway and um, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. He's been on Jimmy Kimmel's show now for a long time. And um, He's got a, a long history of, of uh, you know, working in the industry, but also kind of growing up in it and uh, is a big fan of the variety specials of the 70s and 80s, which sort of led to how we reconnected a few years ago. Uh, and Steve, um, if you would be so kind as to tell the good people what you're up to and more about yourself. What I'm up to right now, um, right, right now. Well, I mean, not I'm in the room. Not in, right now, but what I'm up to right this second? Not, not in the room that you're in. Just oh. <laughs> more for life. <laughs> I don't know how much we need to know, but you know. Um, yeah, I'm still working on Jimmy Kimmel Live. I do the uh, clip research and um, and clearance for uh, for that show. It takes up a lot of my time. Uh, and I also started um, a documentary that I'm about. Uh, 85, 90 percent edit, uh, finished shooting, and we're in the middle of editing it right now. And um, it's about the Star Wars holiday special, which is probably one of those cultural uh, phenomenons that um, you two are well aware of. I know, Jason, you are. So um, that's kind of what I'm up to right about now. And um, but you you have uh, because. You and I talked about this holiday special. You you brought it to my attention years ago. You started kind of the the seeds of, um, you know, why hasn't somebody done something on this? It's such an interesting story. And I think part of it was you were coming to me because of, you know, my background and, you know, the stuff I'm into. And, you know, you love Star Wars and, you know, uh, saw it a million times when, when you were younger. Um, but also um, because of... This is my this is what I took from that is that because you have a connection to those kinds of specials, um, it seemed like this was the ultimate, you know, WTF kind of variety special. But, you know, why is hasn't it been explored? It's it's yeah. only been explored in, in the sense of, you know, people bad mouthing it for, you know, for, for 40 some years. Right. Um, but wh where did that sort of come from? Where did it gestate? Um, it came from, um, I have a trade association that is, uh, we have about, there's about, uh, 400 members called AMCUP and they're all people in the footage business who have stock comp, who have stock footage, who shoot stuff, people from the studios that license footage. Um, a lot of hobbyists are in it. And um, we were going to do an event about some, like, really horrific uh, special. You know, like some, like, revisit something like the Brady Bunch Variety Hour or uh, something really disastrous. And when I started looking into the Star Wars Holiday Special, I didn't realize that I had all these connections into it. My, as you know, my father was 
uh, Bob Hope's agent for a lot of his career, ran his production office, and then was his manager um, towards the end of his career. So I kind of grew up in that whole TV variety, bad television, not just not just being able to see the bad television that everyone else was having fun with watching on YouTube now, but I got to grow up in it and see like why it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it in its incarnations, you know, my father would like, I remember there was this writer who, he was a friend of mine and he had submitted some jokes to the show and it was ridiculous because he had no writing experience at all. You don't just start at the Bob Hope special. You know, you don't just start your career writing for Bob Hope. And, you know, you start uh, with uh, maybe, uh, you know, Marty Ingalls, you know, and then you kind of, you kind of work your way up from your Norman fell, you know, then you kind of slowly work your way up, you know, um, (laughs) So I remember him reading these jokes to me and um, my, my friend was there with me watching it. And he was, um, he was, he looked, he was looking, reading the jokes and we were watching him read the jokes and he was, we were reading the jokes along with him and he goes, that's a funny joke. <laughs> and he looks at the next one. Oh yeah. That's a funny joke. <laughs> for years, me and my friend, we used to mock, like we used to try to challenge each other to try to sound as un as unamused as possible while saying the most amazing things about someone. That's absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so um so anyway, we we I noticed because I grew up with a lot of these people that I just looked at the IMDb page and I realized that a very, very close family friend that my father actually had represented when he was at um, International Creative Management for a five-year period, he represented this guy named Steve Binder, who is the director of the Star Wars Holiday Special. He's actually one of the most, by far, critically acclaimed television directors of all time. He directed... The, star, the Elvis Presley uh, comeback special. I mean, right there, that's one of the most amazing. If you guys have ever seen that, that is oh, the most. Bender did the, he did the 68 comeback special, Bender yeah. directed? Oh, yeah. no kidding. Oh, I don't know if I knew that. And it, it not only was brilliant, but it's, it's just – it's just the ultimate stuff to watch of Elvis Presley. It's, it's the, it's the greatest performances he ever gave every, yeah. every single thing in that. That to me was his, was his peak, but, but, but you started, so that, that's a great, that's a great way to, to jump in is that a, a lot of these variety specials, I mean, you started to see a lot of the, the same names pop up in these shows, whether it was, you know, writing teams or, you know, the likes of Bruce Valanche or whomever. And it's, you know, basically you could, you could go back in time and think right around 78, who would have gotten the calls to do something like this, this. Yeah. 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 And um, Bruce Valanche was not in my dad's um, circle of friends or wheelhouse. Bruce Valanche was doing, a lot more of the really, really campy um, television specials. The, the specials my dad was doing were just bad. They were just the Bob Hope specials, you know. And, you know, I would – the bummer was is that, you know, Hope used to produce five or six of these a year. So there was always an opportunity that I would always be excited to know who was going to be on the show because I knew – that I was probably going to get an opportunity if I wanted to meet that person. And there was never, here we go. There was never (laughs) anyone remotely interesting on the shows for me. I could have hung out with any of these people, you know, so, but he would try to impress me, you know, he'd say, Oh, we got a, Oh, we got a, you know, we got you know the one that, that that they always make a joke that it's it's uh, Lonnie Anderson and and uh, Brooke Shields um, and uh, Donnie and Marie 
But, you know, the one that he had on all the time, and it was really pathetic because she used to, he was, it was an opportunity for her to sing, which is a whole nother avenue of the variety television genre, was Linda Carter. And he was, oh, we got Linda Carter on the show, you know, like she's going to sing, she's going to sing Silver Bells with Hope, you know, and just like, wow. <laughs> Dad, you know, I'd love to come. I'd love to come, but I really, I've got some. (laughs) But that's a great, but that's a great name to throw out there because she would have been, I mean, Wonder Woman was a, was a hit show. What was it, Brian? Was it 76, the first season? 75 or 76? Uh, I I think, I think it was 75. Yeah. Um, Now, now I have to look it up because it it did run, it did run like it flipped networks and, um, it ran, I think, four seasons. So, and I think she, um, I think she got her first special in, I want to say, seventy six or seventy seven. I remember watching it actually. Um, I think she did too. Is it, I don't know if that's the one where she does all the rock and roll outfits, like oh, with the kiss. The, yeah, I, 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 I remember that, and I remember I get it mixed up with a share one I watched as a kid. Now, I have a quick remember. question. I have a quick question. Um. Now, Jason did not know of this, but are you aware of the Moloch uh, clip from uh, Chips? <laughs> oh, my gosh, yes. Um, yeah. I have a huge I very fan. Disappointed, of... Very disappointed that Jason, I stumped Jason with that. Donnie he... Most is Alice Cooper slash oh. Gene Simmons, right? Yes. Well, and the best part was... Uh, was Peter Marshall as the greedy rock and roll manager with no morality. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I don't care about danger. These kids, these kids are our money ticket out of here. <laughs> now, well, my daughter and I, our favorite uh, TV thing ever is the punk rock episode of Quincy. Have you ever seen that? Oh, oh. You know what I have. I have. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's funny because... Uh, I am not kidding with you. I bought right before COVID. I bought like all seven seasons of Quincy. Dear God. <laughs> I'm working with uh, at Kimmel. There's a guy I'm working with now who it turns out we just started laughing one time about Quincy. And yeah. how he was always saying, you know, he was so self-righteous. You know, the way he would always like, he'd always like someone would like say, Hey, yeah, you know what? Yeah, we're just, uh, we just, it's all business, okay? We make lots of million dollars off these kids. And then he would always look at them like, what are you talking about? (laughs) We're talking about, don't you know you're talking about murder? Murder. Murder. And it was just so perfect. They had like five R's in it. Oh, it was just, you know, yeah, that's great, but you're talking about murder. (laughs) <laughs> with his furrowed his furrowed brow. Well, I was telling I was telling Steve earlier about the one of your favorite things, Brian, is the Buck Rogers, uh, Lars, Lars, Lars Mangroves. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, rock, the space rock and rollers. Jerry Jerry Orbach, you know. Yes. So and it, it is it's not a tangent. I mean, this really is like the, 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 those are to me are examples of executives or show you know the people writing the show that are going what's happening in the culture right. <laughs> You know, this punk thing seems to be taken off. What if they're all, you know, degenerates or, you know, whatever? Um, it's a hit killed slam dancing. Right. And then all of a sudden, there's someone who pipes up, hey, we need a new vehicle for Jack Klugman. Remember the remember the slob from Odd Couple? <laughs> <laughs> remember the guy who was the funny guy? On, on the, it was a slob with the hat and everything. Why do we make him a coroner? <laughs> he wasn't there's just- a... There's a really famous uh, Canadian TV show called Wojek that, honest to God, I think they just stole Quincy from. Uh, and it was he was played by John Vernon um, here in Toronto. And that uh, a lot of people think that Kojak or Kojak um, that uh, Quincy was just swiped from uh, Wojek. Oh, so self-righteous. He also also got a lot of action. Quincy Quincy got a lot of action. Like, well, yeah, like, the opening of the show has him with a hot babe on his boat. On his oh, boat. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah, his, his daughter's friend. Klugman. Klug, <laughs> you know, not to segue, 
not to say, but, you know, one, of, one, of my, one of my pet peeves is um, when, and this is off topic, of course, but um, is like when Jack Nicholson or Clint Eastwood in the latter part of their careers, when, you know, they don't have the, you know, it's it's one thing if you're if you're Jack Nicholson and you're playing some really cool guy on a motorcycle or whatever, and you give the little wink, you know, and that attitude and the little, you know, the furrowed brow and the little, you know, that little cute look, you know, he has a way of charming people, and Clint Eastwood too. But you know, when they're not cops, when they're not playing cops and they're in their eighties. <laughs> And they're playing postmen, you know, women are not supposed to be falling all over themselves for it. There's a movie that uh, Clint Eastwood directed. Um, it's the, I can't remember the one, it was, oh, so bad. And it's the one where he um, he's playing the journalist and, um, and he's trying to get the guy off death row. Who's oh, got a, I saw that. What you're talking there, about. There's like the women in this movie are falling all over themselves. And he's like an 80 year old reporter that lives in an apartment. And it's like, dude, that's not the same guy that they're all falling. You can't, you can't keep doing that whole wink and like, oh, he's so, you know, he's not Dirty Harry. He's, yeah. still, got, Dirty he's Harry. Still, still got the wink. But, but speaking the women of women are literally you should watch it and count how many women are <laughs> falling even his boss is uh the comic dennis um leary and his of course clint eastwood had an affair with his wife too so he doesn't like him it's like oh he can't he can't miss he can't I think miss. It's, called, it's called blood something it's got blood in the title if it's the thing i'm thinking of You're thinking blood. of blood work that wasn't blood. No, something else. Oh, another 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 journalism role for him. Um, oh gosh, sorry. Yeah, that reminds me of when Robert Mitchum is playing like Philip Marlowe in his, late in his career, and uh, I think it's called Farewell, My Lovely. Yeah, it's uh, 1979, I think. Yeah, right? and women are throwing him, themselves oh. at him, and it's like, yeah, this this is believable. Because oh, um, well, uh, he could get weed. Yeah. <laughs> Because Mitch was always holding, I think, right up until he, he died. But um, but the see, first part is that Clint Eastwood is directing all these women in the scenes. Okay, yeah. you gotta, you gotta Clint, come. East, Clint Eastwood's one of our biggest fans of this show, so let's not spend yeah. the whole time. <laughs> let's not alienate a listener. Never missed an episode. Um, but you said something interesting today. No, no. Yeah, you we said are kidding. Earlier today, Steve, about the variety special and what these things aim to do. And I want you to talk about that a little bit because, because, you know, I would bet between us, Brian and I have seen, we may not like be collectors of such things, but we've seen, you know, the campier and the sillier, the better. I'm sure we've seen most of the, you know, the, the Telly Savala special, the Linda, Linda Carter one, the, um, I'm sure we've seen the Starland vocal band show. And, you know, you know, we, we appreciate, you know, weird stuff like that. I have but, I have all eight hours of the uh, star of the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. Thank you. Oh, and, and have, have you watched it? Oh, not in one sitting. No. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, little by little. I forget. Ever, I forget ever, which one I was watching, but I swear to God, it was like Paul Lind and um, someone else fighting for the affections of Alice. <laughs> And I just remember, like, I don't think anyone's interested in anyone here. Like, you know. Rip Taylor? Maybe Rip Taylor? Yeah, I think it was Paul Lynn and Rip Taylor fighting for the affections of Alice. And it was like, mm, this is. Well, it was like the uh, the, Paul Lynn, the Paul Lynn Halloween special. with It's him and Tim Conway as truckers. And they, mm. they, could, not, they could not be more campy. They're just, they're. they're <laughs> They're wearing pink and and baby blue, and they look like they just look insane. But they're they're like fighting over uh, Pinky Tuscadero, like that was the 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 female talent they got for that. I mean, that's a great example of, of an insane. And I mean, and, and I want to point out too, it's laughless. It's like, 
completely laughless. Yeah, like you're just like, oh boy, like the whole yeah, thing. There, there is quite a great clip. Uh, you mentioned Pinky Tuscadero. There's a great clip I got for Jay Leno when we had Ron Howard on, and it was the cast of Happy Days on the Captain and Tennille show. Ew. They're doing a big dance number, and at one point, Ron Howard's dancing along with them, and, this, and he starts, and he stops, and the music stops, and he sings a verse of, like, Heartbreak Hotel. Oh. Totally dead serious. Yeah, that's a beauty. Well, it's like the, it's like the, the bit in the Paul Lynn Halloween special. Toward the end, I think it's him and Florence Henderson start, <laughs> start singing start singing the song Disco Baby. You know, move it in. Oh, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yes. The way, yeah. But the way they're doing it, the way they're doing it, you would think the song was already 10 years old. <laughs> and this is like a, a tribute act that was doing it in Vegas somewhere. Oh, like, Branson, like Missouri. Like, I mean, it's like it's like the song was already, it's only been out for six months, and they're doing yeah. this this version of it that is clearly aimed at a different audience altogether. Or they're not gonna. That's so funny. It's like a it's like a conversion ability that some some acts have to actually date material. Yeah, that, as it's being written. Yeah, as yeah. It's I, have you ever heard May West do the Beatles? Oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> It's brilliant. You it sounds a, like it's from the 30s. There's a great, there's a great show called, um, and it was right in this. I, I want to say it was 78. I've actually been trying to get it. It might even be on YouTube. Sometimes I'm, I never think to even check YouTube, which is pathetic. But it was a, uh, it was called The Beatles Forever, and it was, um, it was like 10 people doing, like it was Stephen Eady and Paul Williams and Tony Randall and. All Anthony Newley doing these versions of Beatles songs. <laughs> I remember at one point they're doing uh, a little help from my friends, and it's like it's Tony Randall, Anthony Newley, and Paul Williams singing that song. And when it's they like you the never first, wanted <laughs> the first verse, the first chorus, you know, it's like what what is it? Help me out, uh, Jason. It's I get. I get by with a little help, my friends. I'm going to try with a little help. I get high. So Ted, so Anthony Newley sings the first line, and then and then the camera moves to Tony Randall, who sings the second line. And then it gets to Paul Williams, who goes, I get high with a little help from him. And it's like Tony Randall gives this look that's so classic. It's like this is our drug Con, you know, this is our drug demo on our show. Right. The eyes watching. He's the cool guy that smokes weed. You know what I mean? <laughs> there's, a, there's a clip of um, who was the guy that used to host the uh, Miss, Miss America pageant? He he sort of had a southern kind of accent. He was like a game show host, too, but he sort of had a southern accent. You know what I'm talking about? He, yeah. said his, he does a version of Let Him In by Paul McCartney and Wings. Oh, and wow. it's it's like nothing you've ever you've wow. ever it's just it's just bizarre. But that's why like this this stuff is like when you see the the thing the them doing disco baby it's like disco baby, you know, yeah. it's like there's not even a, a a remote and that's what makes this stuff so fascinating. Like okay, what and but you said something interesting the other day or today whatever it was Steve about the intent for these variety specials. It was it was it was family viewing and, and in the sense of they were trying to put stuff in there for every part of the family. Like right. The right. So when you had, you, you know, these people would book these shows and it seemed like every, even beyond, like, if you go to like the love boat, you know, there was always like on the love boat, there was out of the three couples, there was always like, you know, some TNA, there was like Lonnie, well, Lonnie Anderson and Eric Estrada, whatever. And then, but then they would always have to be then like Norman Fell and, uh, you know, uh, Cheetah Rivera or whatever, you know, or, or you know, Jerry Vale or some older people to kind of like 
to to pull everyone in. And they used and they did that, of course, in the Star Wars holiday special. You know, they have Jefferson Starship for the kiddies. They have uh, um, uh, uh, I'm losing the, the I can't believe I'm forgetting her name. Diane Carroll for the for the older men and she, mm-hmm. uh, for the older Wookiees to pleasure themselves to in the living room. <laughs> yes. And Di- Diane Carroll, by the way, was in the Beatles forever. Oh, my oh. God. You're right. You're right. Look at that. It all comes back. It all to comes back to the Beatles forever. It always comes back to the Beatles. That's a great, that's a great show. You got to watch that. I'm I'm going to look it up right after this. Um, uh, so, yeah, so that was the and, and so without giving too much away because the documentary. You know, you, say, can I interrupt real quick? The, yeah, I'm I forgot the best part of when Tony Randall. Oh, God. <laughs> when it moves from Tony Newley to Tony Randall. He actually, if I'm not mistaken, gives like a thumbs to the to to, to Paul Williams, like, and he's the one who's gonna get high with, because he's got. <laughs> hair. We're not we're not those guys, but we got someone here that's the you know represents the drug fans, you know, <laughs> and and that's another perfect example. Like they had Paul Williams there, I think at that time was their unbelievably bad way. Of appealing to little st- a little stoner audience there, you know, and they got you know. Anyway. They seemed to have him on retainer at that time. Yeah, uh, he he did everything. I mean, he did every freaking variety special, you know, imaginable. Um, it seemed. I mean, it. I know he's and and oh, you know, his his stuff and his issues and stuff. But so you started thinking about in, in the context of this stuff. And Star Wars, the Star Wars Holiday Special, and the number of people that might have been involved with it and that seemed to be involved with it. And kind of, you know, where, tell us where this sort of took you or how you and I started. Well, to- I, I wound up, um, my first impression was like, I can't believe no one has done a documentary on clearly, and I don't care what anyone says, Clearly, one of the most interesting things in the history of Star Wars uh, culture is the production of this bizarre. I mean, they've gone on and talked about how bad, you know, the Phantom Menace is on and on to nauseam. I mean, the special was two hours. I mean, that I just can't believe that, you know, you, you see all of these. Uh, I just was I was actually for the show. I was looking for some. Um, through some uh, for some Star Wars content, <laughs> that's crazy when it's actually my job. Um, <laughs> looking for some Star Wars content, and um, we had uh, um, there's that cool there's this really cool place called thing called Flyovers. Have you seen this? That's pretty wild. It's a whole. It's all these. They took these animated or CGI flyovers of all the planets. Oh, in- I did watch that. It's on Disney Plus. It's very cool. Yeah, I thought that was great. It's just amazing how as wide as this uh, as this universe is, literally <clears throat> universe. I just can't believe with all the, the Star Wars documentaries that no one has done this and these people most of these a lot of these people are alive it's not like you know you're not going to get harrison ford and you know the big stars that are in it but and and almost all the stars that coincidentally all the stars that were guest stars in it have passed away but like all the people that made it are still around and they're having to atone for that (laughs) well and it's but it's also it's um it's it's you know one of the things that you know Brian and I talk about on the show a lot and we're we're in a, you know in agreement as far like you know Brian likes Star Wars like early days of Star Wars and like when it came out and stuff and I think we're we're both in agreement on that that wilderness period you know between seventy seven and you know seventy nine eighty yeah right was, you know what they didn't Can totally I... make sense and you know Snaggletooth didn't have a last name and Can you I... know. Can I go backwards real quick? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. No. Um, I wanted to tell you one great anecdote about the Bob Hope special. Oh, that's sure. far back. Huh? This, oh. this was um, 
This was my dad at, at, at his perfect. This is exactly how my dad produced special. So he's, I remember around, and I remember what year it was, but I remember like, remember Michael Jackson swept the, uh, the Grammys like in 85 or so with Thriller. And then the next year, I think it was Lionel Richie. And then the next year, I think it was Janet Jackson. So <clears throat> Janet Jackson was huge in the news. And my dad comes home and says, uh, so you're not going to believe what we booked on the Hope Show. And I'm like, hmm, let's hear this one now. Let's go ahead. <laughs> Try to impress you there. Um, this is Janet Jackson. I said, Janet Jackson. Oh, no, no, no. He says, uh, it's Latoya Jackson. Latoya Jackson. I said, Latoya Jackson. He goes, oh, yeah, she's great. She's great. I heard her. I saw her videos today. And I saw, you know, they, they sent me the music on her. She's great. And I could see my dad watching her music video thinking, oh, yeah, this is great for the kiddies. You know, yeah, this is, this is something that will work. And I said, Dad. I just can't imagine because he, she was actually famous at that time too, but it was because she had posed naked in penthouse like that same month. So I tell my dad, dad, I can't believe Mr. Hope, uh, which is what we call them in the days. Mr. Hope would want to have Latoya Jackson because he's so conservative and they were always so selective about who they had on the show. And he's like, well, she won all those Grammys the other night. Oh. I said, Dad, that was Janet Jackson. And he's like, oh, it's I, I got the right one. I got the right one. And um, he never said another thing about it. He obviously realized he screwed up and probably told the same story to Hope. And he probably believed it. Oh, yeah, she won all these Grammys the other night. Oh, yeah, she'll be great right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so so to get back to the special the holiday special so i remember one of the first people i contacted when i thought boy i know steve binder and he was the director and the first thing that that freaked me out about steve <clears throat> binder was he told me that i finally started saying to him i said you know if i interview you for this you know that like people are going to, you know, you know that people hate this, right? I mean, this isn't going to be a, this isn't something they're going to show at your, you know, your AFI tribute, you know? And he says, uh, I, I, I think I did a great job. I loved working on it. So that, that that's really, like opened up perspective. a whole new way of like, wow, why does he, why is Whoa. he not taking responsibility for his, for this, a lot of this horrific special. Um, and I remember talking to Jason about it because I knew he was right in the middle of that whole, you know, with Star Wars toys and Entertainment Earth. And for years he'd been in, you know, involved in with the Superman thing. And uh, we had a lot of mutual uh, things in common with pop culture. And what was fascinating when I started talking to, to Jason about it, Jason actually kind of created this extra level that we put the special on um, as far as telling the story. You know, we were like, not only were we going to like, we weren't going to do like a, I knew from the beginning, we're not going to do a story that just attacks it and makes fun of it. If you go on YouTube and just Google that, there's a bunch of moronic podcasts that, People sit around and throw rocks at it, like on that stupid show. Um, uh, oh, what's that stupid? Sorry, I'm going to just say it. I don't care. That stupid show with the robots watching the bad movies, and they just sit there and they make fun of it. Oh, I hate that. Mystery science, mystery science. I said, I, I didn't want to do anything like that. I want to figure out why it is like it is, and explore maybe there's some things that are good about it which i did find out there's a lot of good things but when i talked to jason he said something fascinating that really inspired me and then he inspired my partner with another comment he made so the one he said to me was he said you know i when i saw the star wars holiday special as a kid i kind of liked it and i thought wow that's crazy like i've never heard <laughs> 
And then I went like, wait a minute. You know, I remember, thing, I think I remember watching it and I don't remember hating it. Like, I don't remember like going like, you know, like this is the worst thing ever produced. It was just, you had low expectations with everything in variety television because of this, you know, it's just meant, it's a watered down version of, you know, as someone at um, Shout Factory we interviewed, Brian Ward, really, you should have me on your show. He's fascinating. And he was saying that not one person had a perfect viewing experience because they water down everything to make, to kind of hit a spot with everyone. So not one person really gets a great experience. There's always an opportunity where someone has to walk out of the room and, you know, go to the kitchen because they're like going out of their minds because Diane Carroll is singing a song or something, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's what, what Jason delivered to me was this concept of like, yeah, it's not really. And then I realized it's not really, it really has nothing to do with the Star Wars holiday special being bad. The reality is, is it's just, you're in 1995 or 2000 and you're looking at shows that were produced in the seventies and they were all horrific. They were all shot like that. It's not <laughs> different than anything else. My gosh, I'll put that, I'll put the Star Wars Holiday Special against Kiss Meets Phantom of the Park in a second. <laughs> where, Kiss, where Kiss is walking around the park and like a, as private detectives looking for some murderer. Oh, yeah, yeah, but they're they're walking to to um like Hanna Barbera stock Scooby Doo walk music you know just like that that like white curtain stuff that <laughs> you know and yeah I, I i i won't you can't defend either of those things um i remember as a kid like that was the first exposure to star wars i had um i had the comics and toys and stuff but i had never actually seen the film so watching that special at the time i would have probably sat through an insurance seminar to see Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I got the cartoon out of it. And I think the memory cheats, right? You're a kid and, and you remember, like, you know, you know, it's like reading old comics. You're like, oh, God, a lot of these suck. But, you know, as a kid, all you remember is the ones that impacted you. And um, I, I think um, I, I was just debating this with my son because he's going to show his girlfriend the holiday special soon. And... Um, I wonder if we'd be so fascinated with it if it wasn't so like if it wasn't forbidden fruit, if it wasn't, you know, if it was just readily available, would we care? Uh, because I remember I bought a tape of it in college, like I'm talking like 1991 at a chiller theater. And that thing was like my most borrowed tape in the dorm room. You know, <laughs> guys were constantly, can I borrow the holiday special? I'm like, yeah, you know, and along with the episode of G force where they took Zoltar's, uh, uh, mask off, you know, those were the two most valuable things I owned. <laughs> well, and it's funny because those were the days when, you know, your stuff was all on VHS. And I mean, I remember not to change the subject, but I remember, and Jason remembers, you know, when we were at Real TV, Real TV was like, I mean, I was there for four years. You were probably around there just about the same amount of time, Jace. Uh, maybe a little, little less, but it felt like four. Don't, don't try to back out of it. You were there at least three years. Don't Probably. try to, don't try to change history, man. I just don't remember a lot of it. Though. But uh, what I do remember is that we would get in all these videos. Cause at that point it was like the first daily show of all these crazy videos. And, and of course, when you're dealing with news videos, of course, then you have your, forbidden stuff that was no you wouldn't you know this is pre-internet so you know you had you didn't have like forbidden real forbidden world.com or wherever you would find all that weird stuff now you had steve's desk and you know people would come up and you know because i was the news editor there and they'd, they'd i'd show you know, we'd, we'd there was everything there was all these horrific things caught on tape and we would pass these videos around it was the same kind of thing. It was a little sicker, but it was. Um, 
Well, you, but you also at that time, it, it, yeah, that was a lot of the stuff you dealt with was car chases and, you know, birds stuck up a tree and things like that. But there was also a lot of, a lot of weird, um, you know, you know, weird bits of, of trivia or like, you know, someone that was really famous that was nobody 30 years ago that popped into this movie or you found him in a, you know, game show or something. And you had a copy of the Telly Savalas uh variety special and at that point there was no way to see it i mean i i don't know how how i ever would have seen that thing if you had a burn of it because it was it would never got repeated there was no internet so you i think you burned it onto vhs for me and you had like a, a pristine copy of it i think and it just blew my mind i couldn't believe now you just you know go on youtube and there it is and I was like, you know, my chin was on the floor watching Telly Savalas sing Who Loves You, Baby, at the beginning of the show. You know, he comes in, <sighs> he comes in dressed like Kojak. There's gonna, there's a crime, apparently, at CBS Radford or Studios, whatever the yeah, hell Yeah, it's call. called the Telly Savalas special. <laughs> and then he whips off the trench coat and the hat and starts singing Who Loves You, Baby, with a bunch of chicks in the background. Wow. And people went nuts, you know, because, I mean, a lot of this stuff was you know, off season, right? I mean, the show, you know, Wonder Woman was done and like, oh, what we, we got to put something on this summer. Let's let Linda Carter, you know, sing a bunch more country songs or something. And it got ratings and, you know, but Star Wars, was, you know, was a special thing because there, there was, you could not get bigger than it at that time. It was the biggest thing in the world at that time. Right. And it, it, you know, you know, didn't quite make sense, but you've, you've met, you know, along the way with these interviews and the research that's been done with this documentary, um, I don't like, again, I don't want to give too much away because you, you're finding out some fascinating things about how it came to be. Because I think that besides the, the trashing of it all these years, the big question has always been, how did this happen? How was this? Because everybody thinks of Star Wars in terms of you know, it's locked down. It's a mythology now. And this is how things happen. And, you know, how did the X-Wing get off of Bespin, you know, or whatever. But, you know, back then it just was like Star Wars. It's the biggest thing ever. Let's put right. some of it on. Right. Some, you know. That's, and that's when I remember in your interview, actually, when we interviewed Jason, who, uh, if you didn't, you probably didn't mention this, is is our co-producer on the, on the, you have to, you have to claim that, don't you? Like, just to make sure everyone is aware that I'm uh, I'm involved in this project. I have any bias or anything like that. The Just Star Wars Holiday sure. Special Documentary is a parent company of Pod Stallion, so I should say yeah. that. So is this like, are we, are we like, is this paid content? I don't know what to do. Um, just don't <laughs> swear. Don't swear. <laughs> oh, okay. So, but, but, yeah. but, you know, one of the things that people, um, that's fascinating, and when, when we interviewed you, my partner, who produced uh, Jeremy Kuhn, who produced Napoleon Dynamite, um, was really inspired by something that you had said in your interview. We interviewed you on the first batch of interviews when we were in L.A. maybe two years ago, a year and a half ago, something like that. And, um, uh, and, and you said something like, you know, this is an amazing period of time between 77 when Star Wars came out and 80 before Empire Strikes come, Strikes Back comes out and basically confirms that this is amazing. This is not just a one hit wonder. But there's this kind of uncomfortable time frame where Lucas really kind of doesn't really know what to do with the whole thing. And he's he's kind of experimental as far as putting his characters on the Bob Hope special and on the Donnie and Marie show. And then there's also, um, he's also being very, um, uh, you know, for people who, one of the things that confuses people is like, they know what a control freak George Lucas is with all of his films. So, the big question, and it's not the number one question, but one of the big questions that we have to answer in the documentary is, why did he have such faith in this variety show producers, these producers and writers, 
to take his unbelievable brand new hit and then kind of like walk out the back door and let them kind of just do what they wanted. And, um, you know, for that in general, and, and that's answered by two things. One is people forget that like, unless you came from my, um, unless you saw it in, you, you come from my, my time frame, you don't realize that there was like two levels of the super madness of Star Wars. Like you think, you think like in 1995 when the special addiction, is that right around when the special editions came out maybe? Uh, 97. 97. Um, you know, right around that time was probably when it just became totally insane. But it's bizarre to say that because how could it be less insane? Because in 1977, it became the biggest film of all time. So how much more insane could it become? Well, it it became a religion in 20 years. That's what happened. Mm. And so people look at that and they don't understand that Lucas, while he was somewhat protective of Star Wars, he was not in the mode of, being totally paranoid about everything about it. He didn't realize this was a whole nother, and I, you know, who knows whether he really digs the fact that it's, it's a religion. But the, the one reason why we've realized he had so much faith in you know, a, a television production company is this, the production company that did it was called uh, Smith Hemian Productions, and they were the top tier production company in the business at the time they had done literally every high profile from Sinatra you know when Paul McCartney decides he wants to do a television special Smith Hemian produces it it's not even up for discussion he, they just take care of all of the high end stuff and they also had just done the Bing Crosby Christmas special in 77 which aired in Christmas of 77 which had the David Bowie, Bing Crosby moment in it. Right. If you don't know that story, I'll tell you it really quick. The Reader's Digest version is David Bowie came into town in London to, to, to do his music video. He, did, he, he recorded the song Heroes, and then he was going to sing something with Bing Crosby. Well, when he gets there, they tell him he's singing Little Drummer Boy, and he tells him he doesn't like that song. Now, this story has been told by the writers, the songwriters, Buzz Cohen um, and the other two writers whose name is, escapes me right now, um, that's, that wrote all the special material music for, for uh, Smith Hemian Productions. Well, Bowie, they just tell Bowie, why don't you just work on your, why don't you record your song? And Buzz Cohen and the other two writers go down in the basement and they start tinkering on the piano for an hour. And within an hour, they had created that entire segment of the Peace on Earth thing, as well as the bridge. And, you know, that's that's one of the most amazing, I've, that's one of the most amazing songs, if not one of the most amazing moments in Christmas television history, if not television history, is the Crosby moment, is the two yeah. of them together. Yeah. And it's I really think that when he was meeting with them, that Christmas special aired in November of, of, of 77. He met with them in March or April of 78 to discuss the Star Wars special. So you got to imagine that that was discussed. He knew all about that moment. So the people that produced that moment, the, one of the greatest moments in television, and, and he and you know Lucas was very much into the into rock music and the first drafts of the um, the treatment for the holiday special that he wrote include a whole musical battleship that was going to drive around and play music to different planets and stuff. He really had a huge interest in music. So that to me is what, why we believe that that's why he gave these producers so much rope. <laughs> to hang themselves. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
But it wouldn't. But it. But that's a great. It may. It makes total sense because it's not like it's again. It's this this misconception after all these years, or you know, even ten years, twenty years, whatever, that it's a train wreck. Therefore, the people that were handed it must have been incompetent or didn't know what they were doing or, you know, how did this thing get out of control, et cetera, et cetera. It 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 is what it is. But the intent was not to be what it what it was. It was, you know, it was done you know, sincerely. Um, but it was in the hands of, of the pe- the best people to do it, really, that would have well, been the one to do it. And there's a lot of really, I mean, I have to tell you, like, you know, I was on, um, oh, I forgot his name. It was a guy, a guy on KFI interviewed me last year and he asked me, what? That's <laughs> a really good question. Give me something that's really good about the special. And um, I said, well, the cartoon is good, obviously. Everyone knows that. That's that's obvious. But I'm sorry. I think the B. Arthur scene is tremendous. <laughs> it's very entertaining. And I have to tell you that, um, and you might mock it, but I, I, I would challenge you both to listen to that song again. It's called, the song they did is a version, it was kind of adapted through um, the Alabama song. That's what B. Arthur actually wanted to sing, was, you know, the B., the Alabama song from um, oh, the Nazi, uh, the um, the German. Um, Cabaret? What was that? No, no, no. Oh, no. oh okay. I can't think of the guy who wrote, but, but, um, but anyway, the Alabama song is, uh, you know, Jim Morrison did it. Oh, show me the way to the next whiskey bar. The next whiskey bar. Don't, don't ask why. But it's got a total. It's got a total. Nick. It's got a very um, fascist undertone to the original songwriting and performances in the uh, in the 40s and 50s. So she was thinking of something like along those lines. It had kind of like a marching feel to it, so she could march them out of the bar. And the songwriters came up with this song called Goodbye But Not Good Night But Not Goodbye. And I have to tell you <laughs> that the song is sweet. The song is very sweet. And when I watch the song, I don't know if you remember this the scene well, but the you know, he's all the camera at one point is at the door and she's saying goodbye to everyone and the music is slowing down. And at one point, the music stops and says to one of the guys, I think it's the big bodyguard, who actually is also Mala. Oh, okay. Here's another bit of trivia. The bodyguard in the, in the, um, in the bar is not only Mala, but it's also the second set of arms that um harvey corman that harvey corman yes a little oh, bit wow. there you go wow yeah that and a piece of lint that'll get you something <laughs> <laughs> what oh so so but anyway there's a line in there where he he's leaving and he's for some reason he's got that really low voice which is completely unbizarre like she just he says Goodbye. Or so he sounds like one of those, like he's got like a, the the nicotine hole in his neck or something, you know, with the the cancer. You know, the cancer survivors have the hole in their neck. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's really low voice for some reason when he talks, which is just one of those crazy things. Like, how did that come up? Why all of a sudden they give him this really crazy low machine voice, like? <laughs> But good night or whatever out of the blue anyway so she says to him she puts his hand on his shoulder and she says you're such a dear friend Whoa. and then she looks at him and goes is that a tear friend <laughs> and I'm sorry you know that to me it's so hokey Again, but again, it's not. It's, but, it's, but not, it's so endearing. That's right. It's not. That, that is what endearing. I love about parts of the special is that the Welches who wrote this song, who wrote this song, put their heart into this. 
I mean, it's actually, the lyrics are quite sweet. And it isn't an interesting message about good night tonight, but unless, you know, whatever. That theme has been in hundreds and hundreds of songs all over the right. world. But, um, yeah, that is a huge trend. That is so, that's so ridiculous. And yeah. it, but it's so endearing and it's so brave. And that, to me, is what's great about that time frame is that these people didn't think they weren't worried that like you know when you see a television show now that lives in you know there's easter eggs in it because it gets recycled and they got little clues in it and you know this was something they didn't think they'd ever even see again it was right. just like a lot it was like a performance like it was like it was the little rascals performing a show in their backyard in that little theater that's what this was like so for them to be it enabled them to maybe be a little bit more earnest and right. over the top and awkward in a lot of moments that maybe they wouldn't have if they knew that this was going to be a film, you know? Right. It was it was to get ratings and, and well, there's, there's a bunch of reasons that it, that it happened. But wait a minute. I got to back up for a second. I just thought of this. Brian, are you saying that, that the holiday special aired in Toronto the same around the same time that it did in america yeah we we get american television no uh, I, I no i just didn't know if like you got everything our, yeah we we got it we got it the same time as you although it was just thursday let's not make fun of people in canada jason come on no, but, but but no so i i get he's I always picking on me they're human people too and why and you didn't remind us why at that point you hadn't seen the film no. And saw uh, the, the holiday special first. Yeah, yes. explain that. You know, you just kind of like drove right past that one. What? How did that happen? Um, I, I, can, I can explain it. Uh, we didn't go to the movies a lot when I was a kid. Um, really? And my folks also had this thing in the late 70s that um, really kind of made me a cultural... Um, uh, a cultural icon, <laughs> which was they would roll the television into the corner and unplug it for the entire summer. We would have TV free summers. Uh, yeah. So I can honestly remember um, in, I think I was probably in December of that year going into the hospital for my sister. She needed to go in the emergency room for something. And there was like a people magazine with C3PO on the cover Yes. And I can honestly remember going, what the hell is this? <laughs> like, I had no idea what Star Wars was at all. Like, I don't, you know, um, and all my friends, like, on, like, you know, I lived on a cul-de-sac and all the other kids were just, like, into hockey. So, you know, I, I was up on uh, Mike Palmatier and stuff like that and Daryl Sittler. But I, I, yeah, it just kind of, Star Wars was a complete miss, like, miss to me. So, um I saw the holiday special. I remember seeing the holiday special and that was the first time I'd seen. And I asked my folks, can I watch this? It looks really cool, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very early memory. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, I didn't see star Wars until 1979. So wow. you saw it on the, on the, it must've got re-released in 79 there. Like it did in the U S yes. <clears throat> yeah. It, um, it got that re-release where you got that booklet of coupons. Um, yes, the Kenner, the uh, the Kenner catalog, and then you you had like a rebate thing in the back of yeah, it. Yeah, I took like fifty of those um, because. Oh, <laughs> yeah. collect, you guys collect blue chips. Was that something? Or that just so it was a it was a proof. It was called a proof of purchase seal. It was a little it was a little round blue uh, thing. You know, little little circle on the back of the action figure cards and on the boxes and the idea was <laughs> collect three or four of them or whatever it was from action figures and you know mail away for a free figure the boba fett figure being the first one that was sort of you know they kind of pimp the holiday special on the the boba fett uh on the back of the card when they talk about boba fett and he's an enemy of han solos and all that stuff and then there's the whole rock, the whole rocket firing thing is another another part of that but i um, i meant i meant for some reason, I was making a Brady Bunch reference, not Star Wars. Do you remember when? Remember when um, they 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 blue chips were like these stamps that you get at the grocery store, and you'd fill up pages with it. And if you had a certain amount, like a 
as soon as you got 200, you could go to the blue chip store and buy like a lawnmower or something. You don't remember? There's a whole episode of it. I don't remember that, but I've heard of it. For that. Just I was, I was like bad, bad jokes. Yeah. I was I was at, bunch just, of, just your notes. Edit, edit right around here. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, watch, I didn't really watch the Brady Bunch. I only I, she made. Who was the oldest daughter? Marsha was that the the. Marcia. the yeah, she made me feel kind of funny, but um, I didn't I didn't really watch the, the yeah, show. I don't know much about about that. But um, but that was another interesting bit about the holiday special is that it didn't get I, I think at one point Kenner was going to do action figures of the Wookiee family. I mean, prototypes, I think. Certain, do you remember that? what was the magazine? Tom Arts. It was Tom on the cover. Arts. Yeah, they looked really great. I think they <laughs> they sculpted uh, boobs on a Chewbacca figure. <laughs> they did. Yeah. They, they made prototypes, and, and I, I don't know who unearthed them, but it had to be, what, mid-90s or something. It was on the cover of, of that Tomart magazine. Um, but the Boba Fett, the, you know, the back of the, the, the original, you know, release of Star Wars figures, uh, once it was time to, you know, mail away for Boba Fett, mentioned, I'm pretty sure it mentions the holiday special on the, on the back of that thing. So there was all that marketing, and then the, you know, the Kenner commercials were going to, you know, premiere the night that, that that thing you know aired and that was a big part of it and everything else and um uh but it's just been it's been fascinating to me because it's it's one of these you know i mean we talk about so much stuff on this show and star wars comes up of course but we don't that's not the thrust of everything we we talk about in here but it is it is one of these cultural things that's just everywhere and it's you know the fanaticism the religion and so on and so forth but you know every every corner of Star Wars has been explored. I mean, every every every, every book has been written. Every you know expanded universe, whatever. And this is a little pocket of information on this subject that just there's very little out there about. I mean, if you just want to go out and look for it on the internet, there's not a ton of information, and most of it says yeah. the same stuff. Same stuff. And same stuff it's been yeah. so interesting about this and Steve going to. The sources, and, I mean, Pat Prof, didn't didn't you get Pat Prof too? We haven't interviewed him yet. He's in Minneapolis, and a lot of people don't like to go to Minneapolis because it's Minneapolis. Um, I'll go to Minneapolis. I'll do I'll do that interview. I'm happy to go. But uh, he's, a, he's a legend, Bruce yeah. and then um, I mean, you're even tracking down the the acrobats, and um, you know, yeah, we interviewed oh. we interviewed the acrobats. Um, so, you know, it's hard to explain this story without referencing it, but, um, so the acrobats, you know, the big scene where, uh, Lumpy is watching the acrobats on the, um, hologram, right? There's actually five acrobats and then there's five, like, there's like a ju the two jugglers and there's like a ballet like a like a it's the weirdest group of people. One is like a gymnast and um, one. You, do you guys know what I'm talking about? This weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so when we interviewed the acrobats, they're a family called um, um, their name is escaping me, but um, I tracked them down and the three kids. At the time in 1978, we're like 16, 17, and 18. So what's really great about that is that they remember so much more than everyone else. The one issue, one of the issues we're having with the special is that the 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 entertainment business was much older in 1977 than it is now. Like people who are working on the special were in their 30s and 40s and 50s some in their 60s, you know, so if they've survived, they don't remember a lot, as opposed to like, the people that happen to be 20 years old, those people are great, no matter what they did, because they just remember so much more. Right. Anyway, so they came from this family of, of, of acrobats, and, and um, Welch, um, I want to say Bob Welch, it's the wrong Welch, um, Ken Welch, one of the producers, came up to him and they'd been waiting there all day long. And they, he said, I just want to explain to you what you're going to be doing. You know, 
there's going to be someone who's going to be watching you as if you're miniatures. And he said, there was this movie. We got this idea from this movie called Thief of Baghdad, which was in like the 40s or something like that. I can't remember the stars of it. It was Sabu. Yeah, was it? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I know that movie well. And was it George Powell, uh, Brian? Was was that George Powell? Not George Powell. Who did no, that? No, it wasn't George it's Powell. The guy, it's the guy who played the uh, German officer in Casablanca is in it. Yeah, uh, Con, Con Reed. Hans, Hans Reed. Con Reed. Con Reed um, what's his last name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Con Reed. Con Reed Veit. Veit, Veit. Yes. So, so he's explaining to them that this is a scene in the, where they go, where in this scene... In the Thief of Baghdad, this guy's got this big, this king has this big jukebox, and he can go in and he can look at these acrobats that are dancing. And the father said, wait a minute, I was in the Thief of Baghdad, I was the kid, and those were my grandparents and parents. <laughs> so what's really wild is that when the editor when we gave that clip to the editor and the, we, we interviewed the, the father has since passed away, but the kids know the story from the father. So they tell the story really well. And we gave the tape of the film to the, to the editor and he was editing it. And he found in the scene, like the, one of the next scenes is, is someone that's got um, multiple arms just like the Harvey Corman character. Oh wow! So there, there's all these, and there's a couple of references to these things with multiple arms. Like, it's just these, like, I don't even know what they are. They're just these, like, these kind of like entertainers for the king that have two or three people behind them with multiple arms, showing that they have four and six different arms. So that's and, where uh, it all and came from, probably. Didn't the treatment? Didn't the initial treatment from Lucas also reference? It referenced Raquel Welch, but there was another yeah. band that was referenced. I thought that he sort of name checked. Um, no. Um, there, there is a lot of references towards. So I'll tell Whoa. you the, the the idea in general is. Who's who's waving fairy wands in in the background? Who's who's making that noise? What's that noise? Oh shoot! You know what that is? Yeah, it's it's you making magic tricks or something. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like you're waving wands. I have slack. You're granting wishes every five minutes. It's what it sounds like. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. Let me see. Uh, it's okay. It adds flavor. It tell it tells the listeners when to turn the page. <laughs> That's right. Hold on. Preferences. I'm really sorry. Okay. Audio. Uh. Uh, tell us, Jesus Christ! Tell us about the, um, tell us about the the Raquel Welch and whatever was referenced in the because um, because Lucas put together a treatment for for the story. Yeah, it's it's five pages and it's pretty it's pretty wild. Um, oh, I can just turn off the program. There we go. All right, that helps. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't really hear. I, I hear it so often. It's a, anyway. Um, so uh, the 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 concept of this plot was that um, that that there's a big festival going on, um, and that it's at the home base of uh, uh, Kashyyyk, where where uh, Chewbacca lives, and he's going to be the kind of the um, the head honcho, the big uh, what do you call it? What remember the movie uh, The Grinch? What do they call them? The uh, remember they name a person in, uh, at Christmas every year. Uh, the Who's down in Whoville? No, like the Grand Poopa. Remember, there's a whole big thing they name the the Grinch is going to be the. the yep, I, I don't remember. Anyway, so there, so so Chewbacca is going to be this person. So he's heading up the entertainment. And they get in some spaceship called the Spaceship Musica. And they travel around and they bring rock and roll and different types of music to the, the universe. 
And that was the idea to have this kind of showboat in space, how this music, how this was going to be. So it definitely shows that from the beginning, Lucas wanted music in this. It was not, you know, this wasn't like that people kind of pushed music and, and pushed this musical comedy thing into him. It was, he, he had it. In fact, we think a lot of times the reason why Jefferson Starship was selected was because he was, um, Lucas's first gig was working on as a cameraman for Altamont. That's right. He, um, and of course, Jefferson Starship played on, uh, Jefferson Airplane played at that show. So there's always been this connection he's had. They both work for, San, they lived in San Francisco and Marin County. So, so that was one interesting aspect. The other thing was Raquel Welch is kind of a villain who uses her body to distract. Hold on, I'll read it to you. I'll read it verbatim. Um, Raquel has arrived on board the Starship Musica, and in the midst, this is written by George Lucas, and in the midst of the final preparations, she starts vamping the Starship commander to gain his confidence. <laughs> R2 and 3PO observe this. And since they are not programmed to know about what she's up to, they tell the commander they must report it to Luke. The commander, who rather enjoyed Raquel's attention, reminds them that they know nothing about the ways of a man and a woman. And then further down at the end, she actually she actually just no, hold on. She distracts them with her body and her dancing order. You know, you know, this was a Mork and Mindy. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Raquel Welch comes down to kidnap Mark and mate with him. I think I can't remember. Oh my gosh. You're right. Yeah. God, they took Lucas's idea. They stole it. Oh dude. You totally opened up a whole area. Oh, cool. Just to look into here. Look wow. at that. Holy shit, Brian. Look at that. Yeah. When Useless just... knowledge has some value somewhere. <laughs> that, that, I won't, you know, I won't the... pretend to tell you that I just recently watched that episode on YouTube or anything. Um, wow. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> wow. I have insomnia. Here we go. Oh, here we go. On board the starship, something indeed is afoot. <laughs> And I've never seen the word afoot written. It's A-F-O-O-T. Raquel, under the guise of telling Lumpy a story with dance and gestures about what drives the spaceship, dances her way into the power supply room and destroys things, screws everything up. I just want to, I just want to point out again, if we've lost anyone, this was written by George Lucas. Yes. The <laughs> Written this is by gold. George, George Lucas. Yeah. And so when he talks about, you know, when he, it's amazing because, you know, he, he distances himself so much. But you look at this and you're like, he had something just as worse in his mind before <laughs> the Dr. Bruce lunch. I mean, you know, I mean, are you kidding me? And then, oh, and then there's, wait, there is a part. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, she uses... So they didn't well, use my C minus idea. <laughs> and I think I think the Raquel Welch thing is so interesting because in 1978, Raquel Welch was still somewhat popular, but she had really gone. She'd really kind of disappeared from the poster world. I mean, yeah. Barry Fawcett and uh, but she was doing. He had a couple of specials, I think, too, right? He had specials that were geared towards the 30, 40, 50 year olds. They weren't, right. she wasn't appealing to the young kids. Right. It's interesting that George Lucas, who graduated school like right around 67 or so, he's a whole generation older. And so his picks 
are of course older. He's 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 thinking, what would make my show perfect? Raquel Welch. Now, yeah. now, if you and I were producing that with some common sense, they would have said, well, let's get Farrah Fawcett. Let's get right. right? I mean, Charo. But it's almost like he wasn't <laughs> thinking about what would be the best ratings or anything. He was just like, hey, I dug Raquel Welch. Yeah. Everyone else will dig her. Right. She still was. It was still that kind of name that would get thrown out as, you know, a little a punchline or like, well, she's no Raquel Welch, but blah, blah, blah. Right. You know? um, and, the, and the other thing, too, along these lines are that uh, some of the people we've interviewed have confirmed the fact that who worked with Lucasfilm, who worked on the special from Lucasfilm, worked with George. A couple of people say that the names that were touted in the beginning were much more, um, I'm trying to think of the right word to use, much more um, legitimate names. Like the names were like Cher and Raquel Welch. And um, Well, you're convinced that Cher, because of the Bob, the Bob Mackey connection, you, you're, you're kind of convinced that Cher was very close to being in the show. Yes, they tried to get her, yeah. And she was supposed to be in it, and something came up. Bruce Valanche tells that story. Um, and so they wound up so, – so I guess there's a huge difference between Rudolf Nuria, Mikhail Baryshnikov, Cher, and Harvey Korman, and – you know what I'm saying? There's a, it's a level. And, I, I mean, I love B. Arthur, and I loved Art Carney, and, the, and I loved Harvey Korman, but there's a level of – it's not as big of a special if it's just the people that are on television every week. You know, they're all. Right. But, but, but to be fair, you know, Carol Burnett's show, show was huge. Maude was massive. Like they weren't, you know, they were they were pretty big names. No, no, I. But I think that there's a level of yeah. uh, celebrity. It's you know I think that while these popular yeah, would still. They were still B and C list celebrities at the time, as opposed to Cher, Barishnikov. I mean, that was a whole kind of a. I mean, I mean, you know, holy Matt, what would he have done? Good God, yeah. Nuriyev would Nuriyev would have been hilarious. Very funny, very funny man. People don't know that about him. And he also writes in the treatment that um, he has special. You know, like that there's supposed to be a special guest for the special that drives the, uh, you know, we cut to the starship under the command of a guest star. So the commander of this starship that's flying around performing rock music, uh, it almost <laughs> it almost sounds like, here's a heck of a reference, it almost sounds like... <laughs> The big bus. Do you remember the big bus? Oh yeah. Um with, with I think Larry Hagman and, and um uh, uh Barbara Eden. Jason, do you remember that? Well I remember that the there was one I first thought about the, the Lucy and Desi like the long long trailer or something like that, but the big bus like uh, sorry, Inferno earthquake time. And this was a disaster that took place on this huge, huge like three, four level yeah, it's a spoof. It was. Well, I didn't think it was a spoof at the time because I was a kid. I thought it, yeah. was a, it was an act because it was kind of an action. And, like, you know, the bus is on the mountains and half of it is, like, teetering over the side. So what they do is they they pump all the soda into the back of the RV, but they don't know that one of the stewardesses is there, so she's drowning. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, it's great. But it does seem like that that's – what this was because I remember there was rock bands on this bus. I just think, I instantly think it, like at some point somebody must have thought of calling Wolfman Jack because <laughs> he was because busy. Everything you're everything you're reading there is just like somebody in a room somewhere went wait a minute rock music like an MC you know driving a ship what it's got to be he's in everything because he was in every show and every variety special he ever. did com he did commercials for Clearasil have you ever seen those. 
No. Oh yeah, no, you got to check those out. It's like a kid that. comes up and is like, "Hey, Wolfman, I got problems with acne. Oh, you got to have Clearzool." And it's like, "How is this a thing?" Like, um, you know, he, he, how does your dad's DJ know about your problem skin? <laughs> Well, I bet it, I bet his name for I bet it did come up though also because of the Lucas because of the connection with American Graffiti. I bet that name must have floated around well, somewhere. Yeah. Well, they were you know if you if you knew that the there were these appearances that that the Star Wars characters do that we explore in the documentary, which is they um the one you know this is not secret or anything but one of the big reasons why the special happened was because um they wanted to i'm going to leave out our major we have a, yeah. we have a big go. reveal but yeah. in general it is known though that um the latter part of this is that they did want they did want to promote and do a lot of television to keep the the movie alive in the rate in in the theaters, and one of the things they did is they kept they did the Donnie and Marie show in September, and the film receipts in the movie theater went nuts. So they were like, "Hey, Lucas is like, hey, well, let's go nuts on this. Let's do these other shows. Oh. They do the Richard Pryor show. They do the Bob Hope special. They do the Muppets, and they do the Wolfman Jack special. Oh, oh! I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not the Wolfman Jack special. Yeah. They did a they did a midnight special appearance. Darth Vader does it. And I haven't seen it on video yet. Oh, um, shit. Vader it, shows up on the midnight special. Yep, and it was oh. a payback. Remember the payback? Everyone wanted everyone wanted Star Wars on their show. Yeah. Why would why would Lucas feel indebted to Wolfman Jack? Well, American Graffiti. Right. 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 Wow, that's I see. I just love stuff like this. It's just so. It's all this primitive land of like, you know, they're they're making it up as they go, and Lucas is nervous that you know he he knows it's the biggest movie of all time at that point, but isn't sure the second one's going to do much and needs to keep the brand alive. And, you know, what would you have done? There was nothing, you know, to go viral and there wasn't, you know, merchandise was late because nobody jumped on that in time and he had to keep the plate spinning. And, you know, you get all the, all the, all the stuff that gets made fun of the most is all the stuff from the seventies, all the appearances on these shows because it, because it's ludicrous. But I mean, again, I don't think any. I don't think anybody's thinking this is going to be around for, you know, 40, 50 years. It's just a, it's, it's a, you know, they were probably, most of them were thinking it's a fad. This is a fad. Just like, just the way, like the way they treated the Beatles, you know, like, like they'd get them on shows and Sullivan treated them pretty, pretty well and took them fairly seriously. But, you know, when they made that, the first movie, you know, the, the guy at, uh, at United Artists was, was, you know, tasked with making a movie was like, make a quickie film. This thing that's going on is only going to last a little bit longer. So the quicker you get something into the theaters, you know, to make a few bucks before it goes away. And I would imagine it was similar with Star Wars, that it was, you know, this thing can't, I mean, it can't be that big. I know it's big right now, but, you know, yada, yada. And um, I love it. I love all of it because it's just, it's just well, so random. And, you know, we interviewed Donny Osmond. And it was a great interview. And he's, you know, Donny Osmond, if you've, you know, seen him in interviews in general, he's very self-deprecating. And he was a great interview because um, the Star Wars performers performed on the Donny and Marie show, which is absolutely horrific. Makes the holiday special look like Citizen Kane. Yeah, and it's, um, yeah, it's pretty good. There's a part in it that um, I, f I forgot about. Donnie actually reminded me of it. In the beginning of the, of the, uh, of the show, they introduced the stars. And they go, well, and the stars, from, the, the stars from Star Wars. And it's like there's a shot of C-3PO and 
Anthony Daniels, or, and uh, and um, R two D two, and Harry, as you know, um, Harry Potter. Uh, no, um, what's his name? Paul Lind. Uh, uh, no, the guy who plays uh, Han Solo in the in the Star Wars. Chris Christopherson. Chris Christopherson. I just horrific. And then there's a shot, and he goes, and the rest is Star Wars. And there's a shot of Chewbacca and and Darth Vader together. And Darth Vader, first of all, is like shorter than Chewbacca. But the funny part is that Chewbacca has his arm around Darth Vader. Yeah, that close. Right. And um and Donnie was like just laughing. He's like, I guess that's just the way it is that everyone's friends on the Donnie and Marie show. <laughs> <laughs> but well, uh, yeah, I mean, I obviously Luke you. must have seen that and gone, you know. I mean, yeah. that's that's bizarre. I sent you something uh, a couple of weeks ago. I forgot where I found it or who somebody sent it to me or I saw it on a a page on Facebook or something. But um, it was from um, November of '77, Vogue magazine. Uh, it's a you know it's a black some color shots but mostly black and white spread of women you know in vogue wearing furs the whole the whole spread was about these fur coats and they you know 20th Century Fox lent them Snaggletooth and Jawas and 3PO and R2 and Vader you know and I remember this I remember my mom paging through Vogue and coming to me in the kitchen, like ripping out these pages, pulling them out to give them to me. And I was like, what? It's in a, why is it in your fashion magazine? Like what? What's it was everywhere. It, everywhere. It was everywhere. And um, that's just, that's another just little goofy thing of like, you just, you just wouldn't do that. It just wouldn't happen today. You know, Vogue was like, well, what's that movie that everybody likes? So the kids are, grab some of that shit and get it in for this shoot. And you know, it was just just craziness. You know, you've got Brian because you had a bunch of stuff on the. I think you've you've shown stuff before of like the. Hey, I think it's through Plaid Stallions where there's those insane commercials from the from the, like right after Star Wars comes out with those sort of they're not quite three PO and R two but sort of they're in catalogs and. Oh. Know, um, I think I think you're talking about. Are you talking about the the appearance photos that people are like? Um, no, it was something that was like. I thought you had a display thing from a catalog that was like, you know, out of this world, you know, or some some phrase like that about space toys or something. Oh, I probably and, do. Yeah. Um, these sort of it kind of looks like three PO, but it's not really. <laughs> they put it. Oh yeah, I, I'm positive I do somewhere. Yeah. Um, that that sounds like. Um, there's so much of that around at that time. You know, everyone's jumping on that bandwagon, be it toy manufacturers or, um, yeah, they're, they're, everyone's trying to steal Star Wars somehow, get a piece of it, you know? And and yeah. some of the appearances, some of the, like, the, that, that's the, what I'm working on with that book, Mall of Justice. Some of the... Some of the homemade Darth Vaders that went to malls and the homemade Chewbacca's are like the greatest things ever. You know, um, <laughs> there's there's one Darth Vader that looks like in on his chest he has the apartment door buzzer for, to my grandma's place. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but nobody cared. Nobody like, cared. You met Darth. But uh, what's even better, though, is some of the kids' faces are like, yeah, I don't think this is Darth Vader. <laughs> I don't think that's him. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's really him. I met, I actually met the Darth Vader because, you know. You the Fox been, one, right? Like the one that I, was touring around? I think it's going to be in your book. I think the, yeah, those yeah. photos, that's one of the Fox, one of the 20th Century Fox Vader suits that they started to send around for appearances at bookstores and stuff. I think it was, I don't know where specifically what they, what he showed up for, but I remember mine was a beat Alton in the Maplewood mall. Mm. And it was just, you know, I was a little kid, but it seemed like, you know, thousands of people crowding the beat Alton. <clears throat> and I, I got to meet him. I don't know how my dad got me over there to go up to him and meet him and shake his hand and everything. But that was the, one of the real outfits. And I thought, 
as a little kid, I thought Dave Prowse, you know, showed up. And I told all my friends, like, yeah, um, yeah, I met him. He signed at Darth Vader. He didn't sign at Dave Prowse, but, um, you know, it's pretty cool. And I still have the calendar somewhere. And he just signed Darth Vader in this big, you know. But but there were only a couple of those that went around uh, around the country. And wasn't there a Boba Fett, too? Like the white Boba Fett that was in a parade or something? Or Yes. It made its debut. That's right. <laughs> Um, in a San, it was in up in near San Jose, I think. It was like the Labor Day parade, and you know, um, your friend uh, Scott Kirkwood, who manages the uh, Star Wars Holiday Special website, the official. I don't oh, know. It's not, it's not, yeah, guy from the auction. God. He um, uh, he told me the story of the origin of Boba Fett. Was that he was supposed this this uniform was supposed to be like that that this first uniform was supposed to be like a like a superhero like a suit like a like a like the Marines of the um, of the Imperial Stormtroopers. Yeah, like an elite force. Or- it came from, and then they created Boba Fett out of that outfit. The right. Boba- and- it's, I think it's I think it it's in that parade. I think it's like 1979. Like it's well before. I mean, it's it's paint. It's still white. So they then took it, I think, and they they br- brought it to the Kenner offices. I, there may be several of these outfits. I don't know for certain, but they brought one to the Kenner offices and took photos of it for the card front and back for the Kenner action figure. Um, oh. But. It looked different than it eventually did in the, in the film as well. But but all of that was tied into. See, I'd love to know more about the Nelvana thing and how because there's there's a Canadian connection right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, you know, what's sad is um, uh, in the 90s, my brother in law is one of my brother in law's best friends was the president of Nelvana. And oh. uh, uh, we went to visit him once. And I remember like, you know, um, because we, we had a layover. We were doing something in the city. And he's like, I'm going to go visit my buddy. And and um you know, it was the offices in Nelvana, and to see those, you know, those cells on the wall was like breathtaking. It was really cool. And didn't you get one? Didn't don't you have one? Or didn't you I don't one? have a Star Wars holiday special. I have uh, I have the Doctor Who animation cell. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 crazy. It's just such a weird. I mean, you think about it now, and it's like they're they're debuting this character, um. I don't know where the decision came from to say, okay, he's an enemy of Han Solo and he's going to, let's put him in this. He's, he's more, he's more, you know, important in the, <laughs> in the cartoon than in the two movies <clears throat> that he, that he was in, you know, the original trilogy movies. Um, Cause he's awesome in the cartoon. Um, but it's, it's that fun. Again, it's that little weird, that weirdness of like, okay, they made it a character and they made it important in this, thing they took it totally seriously this yeah. this animated sequence you know aka uh, the thing everybody like i think um they did the right thing by putting that on disney plus i think that's going to um quell a lot of people's demand to see the holiday special on there i i think so too i mean don't you think they're eventually just gonna i think it feels like people are talking about it more and it, putting that up there it's like okay you aren't they just paving the way to put the the special up Eventually, I think there is this kind of thinking that, um, you know, the more the more secretive you make it, the more interesting it is. And that they're just, that you know, Lucasfilm, to some extent, is kind of creating their own drama by keeping it hidden. That if it, you know, we've discussed this, that if, if it all of a sudden was available, well, who knows if that would be even, even remotely interested. But the fact that it's like this, you know, never seen and, and, and that. Lucas doesn't want to put his hands on it and, and his name on it. And, you know, it's very, you know, I think creates more drama than it's really worth. Mm. Well, as I said, it's not that bad. I think it, it's not. I think it's uh, it's legend looms larger. 
I agree. I agree. I think it's just kind of like everything that it's like, it's like a lot of movies that are considered like classics. Now you, some of them aren't good movies. It's that, you know, a large amount of the population was six when they saw it. And, um, you know, I think everything can get blown out of proportion, both good and bad. And yeah, there's, there's much worse things out there than the star Wars holiday special. And yeah, Yeah, the Brady bunch variety hour, every, every, minutes there's a brain there's a barry williams dance number yeah oh and it's the, just not uh, enough and you're right I mean, um everybody got a show. when Starland i was a, got a show and uh, captain captain and Tennille got a show and yeah uh, captain you know, and, and pink lady and jeff you know like pink lady he, and jeff. like captain Tennille was somebody put a clip of that up recently and it was like the six million dollar watermelon or something and (laughs) every person who i think liked it saw it as a kid so i got that but i didn't see it as a kid and i was actually getting like mad at it like how bad it how stupid it was you know and um yeah i could i could see like if you were seven and you remembered that and oh that was funny when i was a kid but it you know i'm i'm an adult and it just it's like this is so like lazy and and safe to to the point of being like it could have been on sesame street or the electric company you know it's it's just and what's his name there daryl dragon has zero comedic skills like nothing i think what daryl dragon did if you don't mind me defending him sure Uh, here we go you you hit the button brian this is a hill to die on (laughs) Dragon and Steve's gonna go nuts because he's the biggest no, Daryl Dragon no, fan. No, 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 no. no, but like I've said this about Peter Frampton. Like Peter Frampton was kind of the pop, um, the pop delivery system for the electric guitar. I think he made the electric guitar listenable for a lot of popular audiences. A lot, little middle of the road. I mean, you know, before you had. You know, the, 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 the lead, the heavy lead guitar, you know, was Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't accessible in the, in the modern, in, in popular culture. And I think in the same way, in a more pathetic way, Daryl Dragon is kind of like a lot of young kids. First, like, wow, he can really play the keyboard pretty well. That's pretty wild. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing <coughs> him musically in any way. It's and, that they gave you know, him a, that, a, a variety it, show to act. Yeah, that is that that is the point though. It's like it's like that. Yes, he can play the piano, but he shouldn't be doing comedy sketches. They they threw they threw shows at everyone, assuming because they could do a nightclub act or they had a number one song, that somehow that was gonna their charm was gonna get them through for you know the sketch the sketch part of the show or you know before Shields and Yarnell showed up and really let the show take off or whatever the variety um, angle is so i mean we've we've toyed about maybe making a separate pulling a variety tv documentary out of what we're doing because there's so much about variety tv that's that we've already discussed and it's you know we interviewed um i've, t- I've spoken on the phone to um jeff altman from pink lady and jeff and he is amazing he's okay. got amazing stories and someone else you might want to consider trying to um, interview who's fascinating and very uh, uh, self-deprecating and, and, you know, is very critical of the, the genre that he was in and helped create is um, is Robert Shields from Shields and Yarnell. He's oh, great. Really? Yeah. And he's, um, and, you know, he's quiet, though, isn't he? He what? Kind of quiet, though, isn't he? Oh, he's very outspoken. He just doesn't get any, you know. He's he's out of the business. He's an artist now. I'm kidding, because he was a because he was a mime. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, they, they, had, uh, they had their own. They had their own show too. They had their own show. I mean, it was. And the writers know. and the writers of that were Pat Proft and uh, Lenny Rips, who they thought would be really good to work with non-verbal Wookiees because they worked on the Shields and Yarnell show. (laughs) 
Uh, that's exactly how the two writers, the two first writers, Pat Proft and um, Lenny Rips, got the gig on the holiday special. Also directed by Steve Binder. Good Lord. See, it's I, I love it. It's like um, six degrees of, of lumpy or whatever you want to call it. Um, OK, well, I guess we've been talking for a while here. We should probably try to wrap this up um, because that's probably more information than anybody has a right to to get about the Star Wars holiday special and variety specials. And you don't want to give too much away from the actual finished product and where, where this thing is heading, because I think it I really do think it's a fascinating uh little corner of pop culture that nobody has explored nobody has tried to push the boat out on this um until you really got it got it moving and um it's fun to be a part of and uh i think it's going to be awesome i can't wait to to see it obviously yeah i'm dying to see it um I'm, i'm literally looking forward to it actually these are the kind of rabbit holes i like to fall down on um but now I've got to find out. I've got to watch. I can't go to bed tonight until I watch Shields and Yarnell do those robot people. Oh, man. That was so <laughs> yeah. They had their own show. and they Two did, years. Two seasons. They got two seasons it had? Two seasons? <laughs> I Amazing. thought it was like a mid-season thing and they got like six episodes. They got two seasons of a show. I mean, that, you know, you know it's, I think of them in the same breath as moment shots remember moment shots yeah of course yeah i mean that was you know you sure. know like, oh, moment shots you wonder why the muppet show was such a thing because the muppet show was a variety show uh it was funny it kids dug it adults dug it it was very smart uh it was done in england so they got a lot of you know great great talent that showed up but it was it was a cut above everything it it took it took the variety special thing and really yeah it turned it on its ear and it, and uh, it's it, probably why it really hasn't been able to come back yes in that because we don't have that culture anymore that's right well we yeah. also don't yeah the audience the family split they all watch different things in different rooms that they don't sit together uh, and the music is really the real problem is that. Music rights now have, um, you know, the music unions have gotten together and publishers have, have uh, you know, raised their rates to where it's, it would be impossible to rerun those. Um, Donny Osmond has been trying to get the Donny and Marie show re, re-aired. Um, he doesn't want to make money off it, but it's going to cost him too much in the, in the music clearance. and mm. Yeah. Yeah. Damn, you know, I'd love to watch that. They had 15 or so songs, you know, they just whipped right through them. So, and that which, was when that I was, was a, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say that was a real cultural. I mean, I wasn't like a you know Donnie Marie fan, but like I watched that show every week. The first, you know, I don't know how many years it was on, but they were part of pop culture. The yeah. you know the Ed yeah. was at the, you know the you know Paul Lynn was like their uncle. He seemed to be on every every episode um and they just were they they were like a fixture for like i don't know four years that show was on maybe or something five years, five years. actually there's an interesting thing um uh paul lind the reason why he was on the show is because he had his own series and it got canceled from abc so he was still under contract and they were paying him out his contract like however much he was making to be, to have his own show and he was just that's why so it was free money for I mean that was the way they ABC they didn't pay people off in those days. They said, You go to Donnie and Marie and you work it off. <laughs> <laughs> you work it off. You'll be crying when you you know. But they <laughs> uh, when I was doing some of this research about the you know, I always thought like, you know, those bad I really kind of thought I'd read up on and heard, you know, the worst shows were like Pink Lady and Jeff and da 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 and and just when you think, you know, you think you know all the bad variety shows, someone told me that they worked on the Peter Marshall Variety Hour. And I almost, I almost had a heart attack. I was like, Peter Marshall? Yeah. You know, there's, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, you know, the, with the disappearance of the variety shows, it's because they started giving them to everyone who had a face. You know, it was like, Pink Lady and Jeff and the Mandrell sisters and the Keen brothers and the, 
um, you know, there's just so many people that just had their Sonny Bono at his own variety show. And, but Peter, Peter Marshall, I yeah. mean, imagine. And it, 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 they said it was on for like eight or ten episodes. Like, that's how long he was on television. <laughs> and every and I and I'm I'm forgetting her name. Um, she could be the subject of a whole documentary. There was a woman I can't remember her name, but I will get it for you, and you guys can look into her. She was her husband was a major, like I'm making this up, like worked for Bounty Paper Towels or something, owned Bounty Tape Paper Towels, something like that, and. Every Christmas, they thought they would produce like a record because her his, his husband. It was kind of like one of those um oh the uh, the the uh, the uh, the woman uh, Zia Pia Zadora. Oh, Pia Zadora, yeah, okay. And so she was the singer, but she didn't even look like Pia Zadora, not even. So, I mean, she just very ordinary looking, and she was a singer. So she first, I think the first year she released a song and they sent the the records, the little 45s, they sent them in in the packaging of whatever they were they owned. Like it wasn't paper towels, it was something else. Well, the next year, it didn't necessarily become a hit, but they thought, hey, you know, why don't I produce a special? And they did a variety special with this unknown woman. And it's fascinating. It's all completely produced just for home, just just to send home. And Rich Little was in it, and he's singing in it. Oh, oh good. I'll tell you about this. It's almost like a Jan Tara moment. Remember that woman, Jan? Uh, Jan Tara. Jan. Um, she's that awful woman that sung those bad music videos in the seventy in the eighties. Jan. Um, anyway, whatever. We go on. I don't know. I think we've we've we're probably going to get enough lawsuits already. In this episode. <laughs> I just before we get to Peter, I just I want to circle back to Peter Marshall. If you ever get a chance, check out the movie Mary Jane. It's uh, an anti marijuana film uh, oh, starring hi. starring Fabian. It's like 1968 too, so it's like really oh. not even timely. And it is written by Peter Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Isn't that what's the one that Larry Hagman directed? Beware the Blob. Is Beware the Blob, and yeah. isn't what's his name in it? The improv guy, um, Del Close, isn't he in it? It's been so because long they, since I tried to watch that. Um, yeah. Del Close. Wow, what a reference, man. What I, a reference. I think so. I could be getting it wrong, but I heard that Hagman was like on LSD when he was directing that film. Oh yeah, he he. It definitely is. A, it's a very strange film. Um, yeah, I don't think Del Close is in it. I, maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I don't know why I, I'm. Actually, oh yeah, he is in it. He's a hobo. There uh, you go. Yeah. They could each other from um, improv, I think. Yeah, they're both playing hobos in the film. It's been a long time. I just remember that was a that There's was a no, movie they brought back in like eighty or something after Dallas got big and they. They tried to promote it as the movie J.R. Shot. Oh, my gosh. God. Yeah. Right. Brian, not to not to beat you or anything, because it's it's you didn't mean it this way. You were talking about something old. But um, in Santa Clarita, the mayor referred to the homeless people as hobos a oh. couple of months ago. Oh, yeah. And, man, it was like, gosh, it's, you know, all of a sudden I started thinking about how television – you know, shows the homeless person. You know, it's so unbelievably cruel. Oh it's yeah, little, they got the little hobo thing with the stick and the bag. The yeah, and that's how they describe homelessness. Yeah, peeling, peeling apple pies off of window sills that are cooling off. You know, <laughs> they, they don't. They don't even really depict hobos right because hobos were just transient, like drifters who came into town looking for quick work and and you know that they they weren't they weren't actually um well they probably some of them were scumbags but they 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 were just kind of people who didn't have a home they weren't necessarily um right uh, homeless people i guess you know what 
there a, a, a symbol that was on like if your if your house was hobo friendly, yeah, carve carve something on the fence the fence front that was like yeah come take our apple pie we're cool it's cool. So Mary Jane stars uh, Peter Marshall and Fabian. You say no, no, it doesn't star Peter Marshall. He wrote it. Um, so, yeah, you know, because he's an expert on drugs and. Um, <laughs> It's it's really I mean I think I once read the um I think I once read the press kit for it somewhere and it was like send your pastor to it so he'll have an understanding of it and he can talk about it at the pulpit and um yeah wow. it's just wow. a bizarre move and it's just like it came out dated you know I can only imagine that it was you know the minute what? it hit the theaters it was you guys remember the movie uh, The Idol Maker by chance? Yeah, Sounds I remember. Familiar. Yeah. That's, you know, that's the real life story. Uh, my, I mean, my father grew up with these people of um, of this guy named, um, gosh, I'm forgetting his name. But he was a, he was literally an idol maker. And he found and discovered Frankie Avalon, who was playing sax with a band. And turns him into a star. And then he meets Fabian, who's a busboy, and he turns him into this sex symbol. Oh, Bob Marcucci. Bob Marcucci. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, what other what and, other podcast? And, Ronnie, and, and Tova Felcha plays Rona Barrett, who he uses to kind of, And it's a true story. They just didn't use the right names for some reason. Oh, I see. Peter Gallagher plays Fabian. Oh, I guess that, that they couldn't get the 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 clearances. That makes sense. So it's kind they of like used. Yeah. Plus, I think that was the main reason because um, it wasn't necessary. I think it was the music because so they just wound up writing original music. In fact, I think the Frankie Avalon song was an original song written by. Um, Oh, I can't think of that guy for road stuff or MGM and Patty Arbuckle. But anyway, um That's your go to. Yeah. Got a hit off it. Anyway. Hmm. I don't make her behind the scenes of all that stuff. Well, what other podcast can you get this much information out of to go oh, from gosh. variety specials to re- You're not gonna get this many Fabian references anywhere. In <laughs> any, not even in the Fabian podcast. No, no. You get this many hey, Fabian what about Tova Felcha. I mean, come on now. Yeah, that's a good one. You don't hear that much. Uh, well, thank you so much, Steve. For, yeah, this has uh, been a blast. Glad we could do this. And uh, thanks for what a, what a fountain of, of knowledge you are about all this stuff. You know, I interviewed Jay Leno one time. I've interviewed him a couple different times. But one time I interviewed him, and it was a really long interview. And he's like, so uh, I'm just gonna, you're just going to use one sound bite, right? You're going to do this whole thing. We'll probably just use one sound bite, right? So I always think about that when I if I do a long podcast or something like yeah you know, this no. is being here's no, a, you, from every Steve. second we're gonna try to edit out the pings <laughs> we <Imagine. laughs> but other than that everything will be in here yeah uh, all right this was great I'm glad yeah. we could thank you Steve and well, nice uh, you, Ryan yeah it was great great uh, great having you on and, and nice meeting you and Steve the the documentary is going to be called. A disturbance in the force. Why this the Star Wars holiday special happened? Wonderful. And uh, fingers crossed, we'll be getting it by the end of the year, hopefully. If you just Google, um, let's see, disturbance, Star Wars special, um, or documentary Star Wars special. Um, a lot of articles will come up, and you can watch the trailer. That is uh, referenced in almost all the articles. So wonderful, and then we'll add that to uh, to the podcast itself. That'd be great. Great. Oh, well, really looking forward to it. All right. All right. Thank you so much Thanks. for your support. Thanks again, Jace, for everything. This was fun. All right. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.